Good morning. These data are from ice cores in Summit Greenland. And what the black line shows is since the last glacial minimum about 25,000 years ago, that's the iso oxygen isotope proxy for temperature. And the red lines show the volcanic sulfate per century. And what you can see immediately is that between about 12,000 years ago and 9,000 years ago, there was a fundamental major increase in volcanism, and that was exactly the time we came out of the last ice age. And this is a little confusing, because most of us know that volcanoes cause cooling, but here's clear evidence that they cause warming. Now, there's very clear evidence in Iceland of basaltic volcanism at this time. This uh, picture is of Hedebraith in northeastern Iceland, and it's a typical example of a basaltic eruption under ice, where it builds a chimney up to the top of the ice. And when we look at the distribution of these, uh, what, are, uh, what are called tuya, in, throughout the neovolcanic zone in Iceland, we find that they were mostly active between about 14,000 years ago and 10,000 years ago. This is the source of the, uh, what's shown in the red line of the major volcanism. Now, the kind of volcanism we're talking about here is illustrated at Barthabunga, which erupted in central Iceland in August 2014. And what's amazing about this kind of eruption is in only six months, it oozed basaltic lava over an area of 85 square kilometers. That's the size of the island of Manhattan. This is a rate that's 30 times higher than what we're used to seeing in Hawaii. And in fact, this was the highest rate of basaltic extrusion since the eruption of Laki in 1783. So it's a truly significant event. You didn't hear much about it because it didn't explode. It didn't interrupt European airspace. The Lockheed eruption in 1783 erupted 583 square kilometers, covered an area of 583 square kilometers in about eight months. Uh, the temperatures were raised in, in uh, Europe about 3.3 degrees centigrade. Tens of thousands of people were killed, primarily by the effects of sulfuric acid on vegetations and food. There was an earlier eruption of Elbge in 935 AD, and the map on the right shows the El Elgia fissures and the Laki fissures of the same area in southern Iceland. The red arrow shows where the camera is looking down the row of fissures as we see it today. And it was this eruption, the Elgia eruption, that led to the onset of the medieval warming period. Now if we go back further in time and look at the Siberian basalts 252 million years ago, these were basaltic flows that covered an area of seven million square kilometers. This was a time of major mass extinction. There were 96% of marine species went extinct, 70% of terrestrial vertebrates went extinct. If major warming, major acidification of the ocean. 201 million years ago, as North America moved away from Africa, the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province extruded basalts over an area of 11 million square kilometers. And then, of course, the Deccan basalts 66 million years ago in India uh, covered an area of about 500,000 square kilometers. These are major, major events, and they're the granddaddies of uh, Barthabunga. Now, if we look at the relationship between ages of mass extinctions on the y-axis and ages of effusive basaltic lava flows on the x-axis, we see a rather linear relationship. And the Siberian basalt, Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, and Deccan are there circled in red. But there are many, many other extrusions going on. And if we look at one, the Paleocene-Eocene <coughs> thermal maximum, the graph in the middle shows how rapidly the volume, in this case, of basalts increased. And this was during the opening of the Greenland-Norwegian Sea. So first, we have rift-related, effusive, basaltic, volcanic eruptions and they turn out to warm Earth suddenly. They extrude basaltic lavas for months to hundreds of thousands of years. The greater the duration, the greater the warming, the, the greater the extinctions, the greater the ocean acidification. They range in size from what we see every day in Hawaii to these large igneous provinces covering more than a million square kilometers uh, during the time that they're active. They cause major warming of air, and over millennia, they cause major warming of the ocean. The ocean has most of the heat content. It takes time to warm that up. They uh, cause major ocean acidity, and we're talking sulfuric acid here. And they cause major mass extinctions, especially when lasting for long periods of time. 
So Bar the Bunga was the largest of this kind of eruption since 1783, and that explains why 2016 is the hottest year on record. I can't, you haven't got time to go into more details of exactly why. So Bar the Bunga is the, the baby of this whole series I'm talking about that go all the way up to the large igneous provinces. Now I want to talk about a fundamentally different type of volcanic eruption. This is subduction-related explosive volcanic eruptions that they cool Earth incrementally over centuries. The largest example in our lifetime was Pinatubo, erupting in June of 1991. These volcanoes typically erupt for a few days, and then they may reoccur 500 or 1,000 years later. But they're an explosive event that happens suddenly and is over fairly quickly. They can deplete ozone, causing short-term warming, and the greatest ozone depletion ever observed since records started was at the year 92 and 93, following the uh, Pinatubo eruption. In this case, the graph on the lower left shows the warming of up to 3.5 degrees centigrade in December 91, February 92, which is exactly when ozone is depleted the most. And it's, the, the depletion is primarily in northern Europe, northern uh, North America, into Asia. They also form aerosols in the lower stratosphere that last for years, scattering the reflected solar energy and causing net global cooling. Typically, it's about a half a degree centigrade for about three years. What's surprising is when you cool a whole ocean, you have a big effect. This shows modeling of the Krakatau eruption in 1883, coming up to current time, and we're plotting temperature. And the cooling of the ocean just for those three or four years following Krakatau is still seen in the models 100 years later. Now another way of looking at this is looking at the sea level caused by the temperature of the ocean. And this is a modeling by Gregory et al. on the lower right that shows that after Krakatau there was a contraction of the ocean, a cooling of the ocean. It began to warm again, but then Agung, El Chichon, and Pinatubo continued to increment it colder. When you have these kinds of large eruptions, occurring at the rate of five per century or more, and this goes on for millennia. That's a way of incrementing the world into an ice age. So what's going on here is a balance between rapid global warming, rift-related volcanoes, basaltic volcanoes, and where the duration of the effusive volcanism is what's important. And on the right-hand side, slow global cooling with subduction-related volcanoes where it's the frequency of these explosive volcanoes and how you increment the world cooler and cooler. Now what's really impressive is when you look at these ice cores in detail, this is the last 120,000 years. And temperature is up on the, uh, on the uh, axis, it's the uh, oxygen isotope proxy for temperature. And what's well known is there are about 25 times in the last 120,000 years when we suddenly warmed out of the last ice age, and you look at the actual data, it's within years, typically less than a decade. But then it takes centuries to millennia to cool back down uh, into ice age conditions. There's two things going on here. When you suddenly warm out of the ice age, you haven't warmed the ocean. So the ocean will suck you back into the ice age until you uh, get enough volcanism to warm the ocean. And then secondly, there can be a number of explosive volcanoes intermixed with this. But what we see is erratic, sudden, major warming within a few years, followed by cumulative cooling over centuries to millennia. On average, one sequence is every 5,000 years, but this is clearly not cyclic. It's erratic. And this is explained most clearly by a balance between effusive and explosive volcanic eruptions. We see this same kind of warming and cooling throughout written history. We see it in the geologic record. This is an example from the Eocene Green River formation between 53 and 48 million years ago. There were these finely layered sediments that you see in the pictures. It was oil shale over Trona, over Dolostone, over oil shale, over Trona, over Dolostone, continually changing. Rod Sertum, who worked on, on this area, argues that the oil shale was formed in an environment you might find today at Mud Lake in Florida. Whereas the Trona was formed in an environment you see today in the uh, East African Rift at uh, Lake Magadi, and the white stuff out there on the water is Trona. And so in southwestern Wyoming, back around 50 million years ago, there was this cycling between temperate climate we see in Florida and the very hot climate we see today in, in Africa. And Sertum's work suggests it's every 5,000 years or so. 
So it's the same kind of scale we're talking about in the ice cores. Now, if we look at the geologic time scale, what's really interesting is that the large basaltic flows, which I've labeled here in red, occur at many of the dividing lines between the different periods, epochs, and so on, that we see in the geologic time scale. You can see at the top of the Paleozoic was the uh, Siberian basalts, so that was separated the Paleozoic from the Mesozoic. The Deccan basalts separated the Mesozoic from the Cenozoic, and so on. So these kind of basalt eruptions are one of the fastest things in geology to cause sudden climate change, second only to meteors. So that these massive eruptions, and there are many, many more that are shown here. I've just shown, except for the Columbian basalt, I've shown ones that are bigger than a million square kilometers. So I would suggest that many of the timelines dividing the geologic epochs and eras and periods and so on get back to this kind of very rapid climate change that we can see. So the footprints of climate change in the geologic record are sudden warming followed by much slower cooling in erratic sequences averaging about 5,000 years. How could greenhouse warming cause such footprints? Now there are many, many reasons here that I can't go into, but simply point out that the IPCC has spent the last 28 years crafting a greenhouse consensus. And they've done a really good job and they convinced world leaders in Paris in 2015 so that most nations are getting prepared to spend $10 trillion to reduce greenhouse gases. That's $1,500 out of your pocket and the pocket of everybody else living on Earth. What if this were to have no effect on global warming? There's now pretty clear evidence that there's real questions about greenhouse gas theory and some of the physics that underlies it. This could be the greatest economic and political crisis ever created by mistaken science. We are scientists need to speak up. We need to talk about what we see in the geologic record. What are the footprints of climate change? We're the ones with a historic record. And we've got to get this right. All citizens of the world are depending on us. Now Michael Crichton said in 2003 at Caltech, in science, consensus is irrelevant. What is relevant is reproducible results. I'm actively looking for ways to engage people in discussing the footprints of climate change in the geologic record. What are the reproducible results? I have a book, What Really Causes Global Warming, several papers, uh, this is a recent one, and a huge website which is fully referenced science. And I have an exhibit booth downstairs and I invite you to come down and, or I guess it's upstairs from here, and discuss if you have any ideas about this. Thank you very much.